Okay, it's going live. Going live. So this also will be available for people to watch later on. Uh, so we'll send out the YouTube link to everyone after if you want to share with other people who weren't able to make it tonight or you want to re-watch us talk <laughs> uh, or anything at all, um, that will be accessible to you and we'll send that in an email after the presentation. Okay, great. So it's 7.05. I'll keep letting people in as they come, but it looks like we have a, a good amount of people here. Okay, perfect. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to to, <laughs> to give us a, a warm welcome. Um, good evening. Welcome on behalf of ALDEF to a presentation of the musical Illegal. I want to thank Olivia and Skylar and also Jennifer for arranging this event online. It's wonderful to see so many friends from so many parts of the world and also our lives. Um, ALDEF, as you know, is a civil rights organization that has started in uh, 1975. Uh, I was the youngest uh, co-founder at that time. I'm a member of the board. So I've had almost close to 50 years of uh, involvement with an organization that is dedicated to protecting the civil human rights and immigrant rights of our community. Um, the topics and themes that Olivia and Skylar and the many performers are focused on uh, are near and dear to all of us. Our families all have this experience, whether they are first generation arrivals or if you're born in the States, we are all immigrants in one way or another. Uh, the issues continue to be uh, front and center in so many manifestations in voting, in housing, fair housing, education, all kinds of access and equity. Um, ALDEF supports and welcomes involvement, Skyline and Olivia and all the performers working with uh, artists of all kinds. Our history has been uh, tied to Basement Workshop and Yellow Pearl and many of our founders are artists. So we look forward to uh, opportunities to team and support your work. And thank you for all your support for the community uh, over the years, those past and those coming. Uh, I will get out of the way and look forward to the Q&A later. Uh, thank you so much for doing what you do. Artists are so special because uh, you can not only take information, you can touch our hearts and it cuts across all of our silos. Thank you very much, Olivia and Skylar. Thank you for uh, supporting ALDEF as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. And it's, it's great to see you again. Uh, since we last connected at uh, our performance in, in the Yale alumni, um, the Asian American event uh, a couple of years ago. Yes. So would you like to, uh, Libby, would you like to share your screen to? Uh... Sure, sure. I just wanted to make sure, Jennifer, you don't have anything you wanted to say to the group before we start? No, okay, great. Um, so if you both wouldn't mind just turning off your cameras for the time being so that we can, uh, we can appear to people in on the top of their screen once I share. Okay, um, sorry, my presentation slide has gone away. Darn it. Oh, I know what happened. Sorry. Uh, yes, technology. I really do know how to do it. My computer is a bit overwhelmed by all the things that it's trying to do right now between YouTube and Zoom and MP3, but we're good, we're good. Okay. Okay, great. So here we are. Um, I think it's still... Can you not see it? Why does this always happen to me? <laughs> All right, we're gonna stop. We're gonna try it one more time. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. Can you see it? Yes, yes, yes. we're good. Okay, Woo. All right, so take us away, Skylar. 
Yeah, so thanks everybody uh, for joining us. Thanks so much to Aldef, Jennifer, and Nick for having us. Um, this, uh, this presentation and performance that we're gonna go through today uh, is part of our, is part of a virtual tour that we're doing uh, originally in honor of API Heritage Month in May and now um, just for Stop Asian Hate uh, in general to discuss sort of what we can do um, in response to everything that's been going on, uh, all the, all the uh, racist incidents that have been occurring targeting the Asian American community. Um, we're gonna be talking about, uh, we're gonna be talking about Asian American history, arts activism, the power of storytelling to uh, ca to cause and to cause change and instill empathy, and also we have songs for you uh, with a very talented Asian American cast that we uh, put together uh, recently. All right. And yeah, just a quick introduction. Also, my name is Skylar Chin. I wrote a musical called Illegal about my sort of uh, inspired by my family's experience coming to the U.S. during Chinese exclusion, um, and. Olivia is. I'm, I'm Olivia Tassini. I am the musical's director and producer, and I've been developing the musical since 2018 with Skylar. And I'm really excited to be here with you all. So thanks for joining us for this presentation and the tour. Yeah, and uh, just really quick before we dive into everything, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, anti Asian racism and, you know, one of the biggest. Uh, most significant microaggressions that I get in my life is where are you really from? Where are you from? Where's your parents? Where's your mom from? Where's your cat from? Where's your grandma from? And my answer is always like, oh, I'm from New York. Uh, then they're like, oh, where's your parents from? I'm like, oh, they're from, uh, they're from New York too. And then they always ask, oh, like, what were you born here? And I was like, yeah, I was actually born in California. So you got me. Um, and so that's, that's, that's fine and good, but I want to sort of interrogate that a little bit deeper today because I want to ask sort of where is the place where I'm from really from? And to that end, I just want to acknowledge that I live and work on Manhattan, which is the land of the Lenape people. And uh, this musical Illegal is set largely on Angel Island in San Francisco Bay, which is the land of the Miwok people. So just to acknowledge indigenous people of the past, present and future. So what is happening, what has been happening over the last year plus? Um, over the pandemic, we've seen a huge rise in anti-Asian, Asian American incidents. And Skylar has also personally been harassed more than four times in New York. We've seen mass shootings and microaggressions and all of these terrible things. And we're asking ourselves, kind of reeling from all of this, what, what, why is this happening and what can we do about it? So sadly, anti-Asian racism, as many of us know, and, and many of us also were not taught, is that it's not a new thing in this country. There, it has existed for hundreds of years. And there's pretty much precedent for every instance of racism that we've seen. This is a huge laundry list of events and legislation and uh, lawsuits, all, all stemming from an anti-Asian sentiment of some sort. And um, I won't go through the details of all of these, but you can see that it's been happening pretty consistently for about 150 years at least. And uh, this is this is just kind of funny. Um, John Oliver did a really good deep dive into uh, anti-Asian racism, uh, you know, in the country over the last several uh, over the last several decades. And uh, he pointed out that if you zoom out on that on that slide on that uh, heading, "Hip Hurrah, Chinese Excluded," there's actually part of part of this uh, newspaper ad says, "Hip Hurrah, the white man is on top," which is just so funny. And I I actually had no idea. So. Um, I, if, no, if you haven't seen his thing, I encourage uh, everybody to check that out too. It's a very good um, deep dive into everything. Yeah, so continuing off that same idea, there have been in this country many political cartoons of this nature that are just openly racist, sub with the caption, the Chinese must go. And the implications of this are, numerous and manifold, um, but this is a, a, an ad for 
a magic washer, so a detergent. And there's the implication that the, not only that the Chinese might be doing the laundry and they shouldn't be doing laundry anymore, but that um, they're somehow unclean. And that's, that's really disturbing. Um, we've also seen, you know, normalized in our cartoons and kids books, depictions of Chinese people like this. Uh, and on a, on a larger scale, we've also seen institutions created like the Angel Island Immigration Station, which really came out of the um, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and the subsequent legislation that was created in order to keep Asian immigrants in particular out of the country. And when Asian immigrants from the West came to Angel Island, they would be detained on the Angel Island Immigration Station and they would be put through physical examinations like this one, you can see the photo. They would also be put through interrogations and during this whole time they would be detained for weeks, even months at a time while they were awaiting their fate and continuously interrogated. And we'll get more into this later, but the interrogations that they had to face were extremely detailed and almost to the point of ridiculousness, they would ask about minutia that none of us would be expected to remember about our hometown or the house where we grew up or any of that. And um, then these answered answers would be compared to the answers given by other people in this person's alleged family. And if the answers didn't match up, that was a red flag for interrogators and could be grounds for deportation. So that's the kind of climate and the location that we, uh, where we center a lot of the action of the musical. So what does this legacy look like nowadays? Tragically, it, it, it looks like open, um, open violence as we've seen in Atlanta and Indiana. It, it also looks like microaggressions the things that people have said to Skylar, Chinese people eat whatever, or we have COVID because your people eat everything. It also is, uh, has resulted in Skylar's family being petitioned out of New Hyde Park when they tried to move in in the 1950s. Their potential neighbors actually signed a petition to uh, expel them from the neighborhood. And so, all of this history in the end is deeply personal. It's, uh, we create, wanted to explain the perpetual foreigner myth or, or illustrate it because we think that maybe this isn't happening in our lives or we haven't heard these or haven't said these to people. Um, even as a joke, the perpetual foreigner myth is basically the idea that people don't understand that Asian Americans are truly American um, and they'll say, wow, your English is so good to people who are born here native, and English is their native language or um, where are you really from, as Skylar was saying before. And um, it, it's, it can be funny, but it also can be hurtful and uh, makes a lot of assumptions about people that are just not true. The other myth that is deeply ingrained into our society is the model minority myth. So people will say to Skylar, ha ha, Skylar, you're Asian. How come you failed your physics test? Or um, tragically, if America is so racist, why do Asians make so much money in response to the Atlanta shootings? And not only is that deeply racist, but it also shows a misunderstanding of socioeconomic dynamics in the country and also within the Asian community, which, is, which has a lot of range of economic status and diversity within it as well. So why is the model minority myth particularly malignant? Well, it comes out of the anti-Black media coverage of the 1950s and, uh, and decades following, which was in response to the civil rights movement. And we can see you know, the dates of this article and the attitude of the writer towards um, Black Americans and Asian Americans, specifically Japanese Americans. So this is, is 
particularly bad because it not only creates inhuman expectations for Asian Americans and is anti-Asian, it's also anti-Black because underlying it is the sentiment that the legitimate concerns and the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow should just be forgotten or brushed aside or gotten over. And this attitude creates a wedge of resentment towards Asians from other groups. So it's, it's really bad, even though it's, you know, a microaggression, it has far reaching consequences. Yes. Um, take a breath, take a breath. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we've, we've gone through a little bit of the history, well, a lot of the history of uh, anti-Asian sentiment in the US and we've sort of proven that you know, it's something that's inherent, that's baked into our country. Um, so that begs the question, you know, if it's so deeply ingrained in our society, what can we actually do about it? What can we do about these really deep-seated cultural myths that were fueled by, uh, you know, pol policies, media, um, the, everything? Um, and, you know, one answer that's very, very important and sort of speaks to Aldous' mission uh, for civil rights, immigrant rights, is get politically active, vote in local elections. Um, if you're an ally, advocate for Asian American people. Um, if you're an Asian American like myself, I don't practice your martial arts and speak up for yourself too. Um, and what we want to lean into as artists ourselves is the power of storytelling. So I think that storytelling is one of the most magical forms of communication that there is. I, I think that, you know, when you watch characters uh, go on a journey, uh, beginning, middle, end, where they, yeah, yes, reminder that the uh, New York City primary <laughs> elections are on June 22nd. Um, yeah, so for story, yeah, so storytelling does this list, do, does like so many, so many really magical things uh, listed here, you know, it humanizes people and, and instills a sense of empathy, um, especially if the characters in a story are people that you uh, come from a background that you haven't had much exposure to yourself. Uh, it, because it's entertainment, it grabs people's attention like nothing else. And also it tells the truth because in every narrative there, in addition to the facts, there's also an emotional core to the story and um, something where you, where you follow characters who go on a journey and you go on the journey with them, that, that's just a very powerful way to learn uh, the truth and see somebody else's perspective on something. And you know, it, and lastly, it also encourages and empowers people to share their own stories. I know that um, I, was, I, was, I felt empowered and encouraged and inspired to write a musical because of people like George Takei and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's I think that, yeah, storytelling is just a very important form of communication that we need to lean into. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you can take it from us or you can take it from some pretty great people like the artists of the Yellow Pearl Project. They talk about the importance of education and making Asian American history part of American history. They say, otherwise we'll be, always be seen as foreigners. And if we don't tell our stories, people can perpetrate violence against us. And this is really important because it's, it's connected to the perpetual foreigner myth that we were talking about before. And something that came out for Skylar and myself while we were creating this presentation was the fact that my family, or, or rather Skylar's family has been in this country decades longer than my family has been. And that's not necessarily an assumption that people would make just based on how we look or what our names are. And I think that that's something that's important to dig deeper into why do we have those biases? Where are they coming from? And how can we change them, alter them? Another in a great advocate of storytelling is Amanda Wynn. She says many things, but I'll quote a few. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy. Silence erases our humanity. In order to be anti-racist, you have to include the Asian American experience. Yeah, and then uh, just wanted to to share this uh, <laughs> this protest sign that um, my aunt got a picture of at the Union Square vigil after the Atlanta shootings. I think uh, this sort of symbolize this sort of summarizes everything 
about entertainment and storytelling that's kind of powerful politically. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a sign that has my uh, favorite boy band BTS on it. Um, and they, it, it just points out that Asians are people too and it uses um, their image and it reminds people that, uh, you know, maybe this, these entertainers and, story and artists that you know and like are humans and they're Asian and that's really important for people to know. So I think if you could sum sum up the antidote, I, I don't know, the the uh, response to stop to uh, the anti Asian violence, it would be to remind people that Asians are human. Asians are people too, just like everybody. So that brings us to our project, illegal and new musical. Um, I know that a lot of people have asked me. You know, like I wasn't a theater person in, in high school, um, but you know, I did I did play in a lot of bands, play a lot of instruments, write songs, uh, rap with my friends. Um, they, they people ask me like, why did you why did you spend your entire senior <laughs> your entire senior year of college writing this musical uh, and performing it towards the end with Olivia and uh, Cass? And uh, I guess my answer is that it goes. Um, I've wanted to tell this kind of this sort of story my whole life, uh, growing up in uh, New Hyde Park, I, um, Asian Americans and non-Asian people both were always questioning my identity and my existence sort of. Uh, Asian Americans would meet my grandma who is a Chinese lady who speaks fluent English, doesn't speak Chinese, and they would meet her and she'd just be like, hey, what's up? And they'd be like, damn, Skylar, you're a fake Asian. Like, what? Are, what is this? Like, you, you're whitewashed like a bad movie. And then uh, non-Asian people at the same time would just like, you know, drive down the street, roll down the windows and scream ching chong at me. Uh, so I was always trying to explain to people like where I really come from. And um, then during college along came this president whose entire political platform relied on anti-Asian and anti, you know, just uh, xenoph xenophobic and anti uh, people of color sort of rhetoric. And I thought that if people had known this history, like if people had known the story of Chinese exclusion or just the story of Angel Island, um, this wouldn't this history wouldn't have repeated itself the way that it did. So uh, overall, yeah, I, I wrote this. I I wanted to write this piece to give voice to Asian Americans who have left have who have been left out from history, like my own grandfather, and also to convey the idea that. We, we have been here this whole time and we've been fighting this whole time. Uh, we've had this fighting spirit, uh, you know, in us, which has not really been represented in media um, with a lot of the stereotypes about us. But uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna get to that uh, in these songs soon. Um, we also wanted in this presentation, we also wanted to, you know, pull back the curtain and sort of go into the process and the source, source material behind a lot of the songs that we, uh, that we staged and that, that we wrote. Um, a lot of them were inspired by my grandfather's actual immigration uh, records that we, that my family found, uh, you know, when he was detained on Angel Island. And also they're inspired by the really fiery lyrics that, that uh, Chinese detainees on Angel Island uh, wrote and carved into the walls there. Yeah, so let's, let's dig into that. The first element of the writing process that we wanna talk about is how Skylar transformed poetry into lyrics. So on the left here, we can see the verses in Cantonese that actual detainees carved into the cell walls as they awaited their interrogations and as they were detained. And something cool that I learned through Skylar and through this process was that the poets would actually get together and they would have a cipher. They would um, share their poetry together and then they would decide whose, whose verses were best and those verses got carved into the walls. So it has this kind of social and collective element to it too that's really powerful. Um, so as you can see, we've got the Cantonese verses on the left and then the English translation in the middle here. And we wanna give a big shout out to the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation for their amazing work in uh, bringing us stories of these immigrants and we'll talk more about their, their work and their projects a little bit later, but thank you uh, again for all of your, all of the things that you do to help us access these stories. So Skylar 
transformed these lyrics, or excuse me, these verses into lyrics for our opening song of the musical entitled Jook Songs. And Scar is actually gonna give us a little demonstration of what that sounds like. Uh, yeah, so I saw these, um, I was reading these poems and you know, some of them really reminded me of, uh, it really struck me as like a sea shanty. So, uh, hey Ed, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, no, definitely thanks for um, all, all of uh, AIS efforts, preserving these histories and inspiring people like me to do uh, what we do. shanty lullaby uh, but don't be fooled the lyrics that are carved onto these or the verses that were carved into the walls were not all calm or sad they some of them as Skylar was saying before were actually quite fiery some of them uh, promised to get into the U.S. and then come back and burn down the Angel Island immigration station and Skylar wanted to capture some of that fire in one song entitled Keep Dreaming and this is the rap verse. Remember how you'd roam around your war torn hometown, repeating that you go to Bull Mountain and promise to bring a peace back, no matter how they beat back Chinese with these acts. Because when you went to see that day, you couldn't see that. Let me skip forward a little bit. Look out through those rigid steel bars, it's open across those rigid green waters. We soak in the sun the moment it comes, a moment to run the morning will come. Yeah, I love that song. <laughs> uh, gets me every time. All right. So it, the poetry was not the only thing that Skylar adapted into lyrics. He also found his grandfather's own interrogation transcript from when he was detained at the age of 10 and asked all of these crazy questions. And um, so you can see some of the lyrics here. These are lyrics from uh, the interrogation of our comedic, our comic relief character, Fat Pork, who was born in the US, went to China, and then is trying to regain entry to the US, but has to be detained and interrogated before he can do that, even though he's technically a US citizen. So rather than giving you a demonstration on guitar, we're actually going to show you a fully produced version of the song featuring Nicholas Leon. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will be able to hear it. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, okay, good. I'm glad. Let me stop my video. All right, enjoy interrogation. Interrogation of applicant number 724. Interpreter is Carter Lee. You were advised your right to admission to this country will be today considered by this board. The regulations state that if your answers to these questions do not match those of your alleged father, William Wong, you will be denied entry to the US. Applicant number 724 sworn. State your name, your age, and your place of birth. Fat Port, 21, USA for what it's worth. Married? No. Siblings, state One. their name and whereabouts. Devin Wong, New York. Did you leave any siblings out? Nope. Grandparents still alive? No. Where's your grandpa buried? <laughs> With my grandmother. Kid, 
Which cemetery? Valhalla, New York. Man, they're trying to break my balls. Now, the house you have in China, how tall are the walls? Like 20 feet. Describe the house. Two floors and a basement. Describe your roof in detail. Uh, the tiles need replacement. Which way did the doors face? The back one faces west. And where does your dad sleep? Upstairs. Whose house is on the left? We call him Captain So. What's his sister's name? The friend. She's General So. <laughs> does the street have a dead end? Nope. Where do you live in the States? Chinatown. Why are you here now? Went to China, now I'm back. Must have been a few years now. Have you ever been to Pike Street? Yes. Describe your last trip. The street food! Did you leave a cash tip? How no. far in what direction? East? This is so bad. Which food truck did you go to? I didn't know I had to know that. What kind of pavement leads that way? Dark. That's not what your father stated. Probably because we're on the border and borders are complicated. Next question is part of your application list of partners doing commerce in this fine, fine nation. Sam Kai Chung, William Wong, and my younger brother Devin got like three to four cousins. There should uh, be more than seven. What's your role in the company? Huge. Your father says that isn't true. You could have been deceived. Just had to check, didn't you? Any others in China? No, we're American. There must be. Yeah, I got them all. You can trust me. Uh, you? Some dumb guy? Something wrong with you? That's enough. These people don't want me here. These questions are just designed to pin you. My dad and me, we can't agree on what we had for dinner. Yo, what kind of crap questions next in this dialogue? What is the name and location of your neighbor's sister's dog? The fuck? Applicant 724, is that the name or the location? How is it you don't agree with your own father regarding the name of your neighbor's sister's dog? <laughs> Yo, just let me in, I'm his son, I'm so done. Check please, you're making up these complicated questions to get me deported. Inspector, you think you're some kind of sleuth? Then how come you can't tell that I'm just telling the truth? Either your pants on fire or your dad's a liar. Heck, not even a cheat sheet could make your chances higher. You ain't the son of a merchant, nor a fine gentry. Can't prove it, I'll move that. You're denied entry. Give it up for Nick Leon. He's yeah, it was so fun to work with him on that. Yeah, that was interrogation. Hope you all hope you all liked that one. And there'll be more. Um all right. Wanna tell them about this one? Yeah, so this one was actually really interesting to find and and then uh turn into a song. It's um, you know, when I was researching the uh, when I was researching, the, you know, the, the backstory and uh, the the history behind uh, everything in illegal, I, I came across this uh, correspondence between my uh, between Angel Island and my grandfather's aptly named ally, uh, Mr. White Esquire, the immigration lawyer of White and White Law Firm, um, <laughs> and I. Um, and so there was this back and forth and back and forth between them, and it and it really read, it read like such a rap battle. So, um, my friend, my friend who is going to law school, and I like, I I I, I wanted to write this with him because I figured that, uh, he, you know, he would he would know exactly exactly how how the law plays out. And um, anyway, it's so, very accurate to the way the law truly is. <laughs> uh, so. I'll just do, I'll just do uh, Mr. White's first verse here. White and white law firm to Angel Island. Sir, I hereby file notice of appearance in the case of fat pork applying for admission in the jurisdiction under you in that court. I don't mean to bore you, but the case before you is number 724, and I've been pouring through the corpus. I'm absorbed and frankly bored by your contempt for court. And then they keep going. Yeah, so we actually do stage that as a rap battle, and uh, Mr. White Esquire and PB Jones, the dastardly director of the Angel Island Immigration Station, go head to head with mics in hand. So it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Another thing, as you can see, Skylar did extensive research for this show. And another thing that he came across was an article talking about how interpreters were occasionally offered bribes by those being interrogated. And they would say, you know, no, don't waste your money. It's not gonna help. Uh, and Skylar wanted to incorporate this detail into the musical. So these are lyrics from uh, one of those songs called Pledge Allegiance. 
and Pledge Allegiance is the introduction song of our interpreter character named Carter Lee. And Carter is Asian American and she is torn between these two desires. The one, on the one hand, she wants to prove to her white employers and co-workers that she is just as American as they are and deserves to be treated as such. And also the desire to stand up for the rights of the detainees, the people who look like her. So we're gonna show you Pledge Allegiance and this will be featuring Sandrine Lee Bontemps, Nicholas Liang and Sita Sunil. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to see this again. All right, can you see it? Yeah? No, no. not yet. Nugget, why is it? Now can you see it? Yes, okay. Here we go. We hope you enjoy interrogation. Sorry, I meant <laughs> Pledge Allegiance. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States for which it stands. One nation, one job. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United States for which it stands. Which it stands. One, nation, one nation, one job. One job. Indivisible with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. I got a job in the fog in the view of the bay. Okay. I bet that you'd want it too if you knew about the pay. And when the clock strikes four at the end of the day, I got a little more honor to my name. I'm an interpreter. Honestly, I'm not in your history, but it's 1923 and my people exist. You need a real quick wit to survive as a Chinaman, yeah, even if you're born here. It's either laundry or cooking if you're a jerk, sing. Otherwise, you're hustling a tongue like a crook, singing for your supper, yeah, no opportunity. So I was shook when the government recruited me. Eight in the morning, I wake and break a fast, make a splash, hop on board to Alcatraz. But my ferry rides a little bit more, commuting to the next best rock next door. Angel Island. A day of cases goes fast, interrogating immigrants and checking the facts. I help do the dirty work that must be done, separating blood sons from paper ones. All Chinese are criminals. But I uphold. Allegiance, Pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States for which it stands. My, stands. Nation, my nation, my job, my job. indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Okay, I lied before. Mr. Inspector PB Jones doesn't let me check any facts. He doesn't trust me because I'm Chinese, but he needs me because I'm Chinese American. Ooh. This line of work can pay pretty crazy. crazy. From the pockets of immigrants with lazy. lazy. I'm the only one that doesn't let it get to me. Don't waste your money. Why? Integrity. You know, they fired all the Asian help back in the day, but then the white only hires couldn't hack it, so they took us back because our backgrounds are worth the while. And here I am, service with a smile. You can't trust a China man. I'm here to prove them wrong. And I'll show them that my courage runs miles deep. Prove my worth and I'll move up big. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the word to of the, the immigration word. station. I serve Angel, I serve Island, Angel and Island and the law, and the law. indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. All I need is my allegiance, and I can make it up. I keep believing my allegiance will help me make to the flag of the United States for which it stands to the border and the walls indivisible with liberty and justice for all I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States Republic for which it stands to the border secure my job indivisible with liberty and justice for all Give it up for Sandrine, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. 
So that was Pledge Allegiance. Hope you all like that. Why, we, what's next? Why, why do we need to, uh, can you can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, wh why do we want to keep performing illegal? So I think that you know putting this show on is how we speak up. Um, it's how I tell my story and how uh, so many people. Uh, I, yeah, I think just art and music just have this power to reach out to people and, and heal and um, build empathy, like we said before, and push back against uh, actual cultural myths, the, you know, countering cultural myths with uh, creating, a, you know, art and uh, something in, in the cultural field of your own. Uh, and we, we also think that this is a way to tell this American history that has been left out of textbooks largely. largely. Um, and yeah, we think that our history is American history and it's gotta be, um, people have to know about it. And yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out uh, that, you know, we've been talking about Chinese exclusion and the Chinese American story, um, but, you know, my story and the Chinese American story is just one of many um, different Asian American stories uh, throughout history and people from so many different, you know, all these different continents even uh, pass through Angel Island uh, during, uh, during the, uh, in the past century. Um, and, uh, you know, the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation does really, really cool work um, documenting, looking at uh, primary documents and telling these stories of people who, um, just all different kinds of people who, who went through. So definitely recommend you check out the immigration, uh, Immigrant Voices section of their website. Um, I know me and several colleagues from Yale actually interned with them uh, during college and we put together stories of uh, immigrants who weren't Chinese, who went there and, and uh, who were detained there. And their stories are really, really interesting too. Um, you know, this first one is the story of the Dillon family. They were a Sikh American family. Um, uh, and they went, they were on a trip to India to visit relatives. Uh, like I know so many people uh, do they go visit relatives abroad. And then when, when, while they were coming back or before they came back, the US passed another uh, exclusionary policy um, targeting South Asian people. And uh, they, were, uh, they were detained on Angel Island for a long time. And they also had to fight very hard to come back home. So um, definitely encourage people to check out uh, the work of Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. It's, it's really interesting. So in summary, we want to encourage people to tell your story in whatever way it, it moves you to do so. And um, we want to thank you again for being here tonight and for listening to us and supporting our work. If you liked what you heard tonight and you just want more, you can um, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and you can donate to our GoFundMe. The, uh, uh, the goal of the GoFundMe is to create a professional production of the show in 2022 in recognition of the 140th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So we'll be sending all those links afterward in an email, but we just want to put them here for you too. And we also want to thank All Deaf again for having us tonight and to encourage people to follow them on, on social media and to donate to support their work. Again, we'll share that link with you all afterward. Thank you again, all deaf, Jennifer, Nick, and the board. All right, so that concludes our presentation. And now we would love to open it up to questions, comments, anything you'd like to share with us. You can feel free to type them in the chat or to turn on your camera and say hello. And while people are maybe typing or whatnot, I want to uh, ask you a question, Skylar, which is what's next for the development of the show? What do you have in mind? What are you looking toward? Yeah, I think, you know, just creatively, the, the, the biggest scene that I want to uh, sort of, you know, even workshop with you is, is uh, building out the scene in the story where the immigrants get together and actually, um, work on the poetry and develop it together and uh, carve it into the walls. Um, because I know, I know uh, we wrote 
we wrote 26 songs in nine months when we were seniors in college. So, uh, and it was towards the end of the show. So it, it, it was, it was like a very fast process. Um, and it was really cool, you know, when we did it, uh, when we had Sophia who uh, is like, is a Chinese spoken word poet herself. So she did a really good job just reading them straight up with the backing track. But um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the scene that I want to really work on. Um, before we before we uh, go for this pro professional uh, yeah production, but yeah yeah to give some people background about that scene it's it's dramatizing the ciphers of the poets on Angel Island and the exchange of verses that they had while they were deciding what to carve into the walls and the way that we staged it was it gave me chills every time <laughs> uh, if I'm if I'm gonna be honest but the we had one cast member reading the verses in um, Mandarin, that was her native language, uh, though most of the verses that we are talking about today were written in Cantonese. And we'd love to have someone read them in Cantonese or recite them in Cantonese for our next production. And then another cast member was simultaneously s speaking them in English. And so we had this really great side by side of uh, the, the verses and speaking in different languages, but also getting I don't know, getting to people emotionally. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to develop that scene. Um, so a question, can you briefly tell us who are the artists and where they are, where are they now? So the artists that you saw tonight, whom you saw tonight, um, Nicholas Leung and Sandrine Lee Bontemps are both young artists based in New York and uh, I met them through the theater community here uh, of emerging artists. And yeah, they're, they're very talented. So they might just be in our next show, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and another question or comment, I can imagine school groups wanting to see a 30 minute version of this that, mm -hmm, that they can use to generate discussion. Yes. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, we have begun sharing this with high school students. We actually have visited two high schools now, at least two. Yeah, two high schools and in Apex for Youth. Too. Yeah, yeah. Apex for Youth in New York, which is a youth organization um, targeting high school kids and younger. So we are very much open to, oh my gosh, my jersey came out there. We are very much <laughs> open to, uh, presenting the schools and we would love to get more on our roster. Yeah, we're building out to hopefully Rhode Island soon. But yeah, any 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 schools you have for us, please send them our way. Yeah, um, we'd love to um, connect after this to discuss. That would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to Would you like to tackle the question from John? Yeah. So as you do the research and learn about the atrocities, how do you keep yourself from becoming traumatized, sad, mad? Um, what is the impact? Yeah, that's a really, that's an amazing question. Um, I think ultimately, you know, going into it, I was trying, I knew that could uh, be a thing that could happen. And I wanted to, like, at the end of the day, I wanted to convey the fact that we had this struggle and that many of us won. Um, and I, and I, and, you know, there were many people, you know, uh, in, even in the story, there, there were many people who, uh, didn't make it through, but, um, I, yeah, I definitely wanted to convey the fact that we're still here. We were here. We're still here. We're always going to be here. And we really fought to make ourselves part of this history. And that's something to be very, very proud of. Um, and I think that's how, that's how we keep ourselves from. Uh, getting caught in the negative side of this of the the history and really focusing on um, you know the stories that really uplift us. For example, we have this. Uh, I, I don't know um, how many of you are aware of the story of Laiwa, who is a real person who came who was detained at Angel Island at the age of two um, as a little girl. She they they were interrogating her and her family and asking her like state your name and your place of birth, Laiwa, and she was like she just sassed them and she was like, I, she was just like, you, you're you not, like, I'm not gonna tell you your, I'm not gonna tell you my name because you're not telling me your name. So what, why are you asking me these stupid questions? And then that just delighted the interrogators and I believe they just let her and her family through. Um, so 
and that's one of the that's one of the stories in this in this musical um and that's just like one of those stories that in 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 addition to the sad things you find you find those incredible stories of of triumph uh and that's definitely one thing that kept me going through this um so thank you so much john for the question I don't know if you have if I could, and, and I, I just appreciate it, you know, your answer, because as you were saying it, I just realized that this is not just the past, right? It's still going on. And oh, yeah. so in some ways, it actually gives us courage to keep going and also to recognize what's happening and why it's happening. And I think that allows us to process things actually even better. So uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I also want to highlight two things um, going off of what you were saying that it's still happening, yes. Um, and a lot of the music and the show and the dialogue is deeply contemporary. You know, rap is a huge part of the show and that's a contemporary art form. So to, to use this contemporary vernacular demonstrates that we are people in the 21st century representing things that happened just about a hundred years ago but it, 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 the the past and the present and the future you know the, they give and take uh, symbiotically in that way and so it reminds people that while they're watching a historical show it's very much up to date and speaks to our moment so we found that although Skylar wrote it at a time when um, the, the country was being run by a xenophobe. It's still relevant today based on what happened during the pandemic. And so it continues to be relevant. Um, and the other thing is humor. I think Skylar did a great job and the cast really took this, the spirit of the humor of the show and, um, and that keeps the levity so that we don't feel bogged down by the sadness. There's a lot of sass and 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 jokes and you know slapstick in the show too that you might not have seen as much of tonight. But um, that that really keeps a smile on the audience's face. So yeah, a lot of yeah, like a lot of the. I also wanted to like pay homage to a lot of the really cool Asian uh, uh, media that 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 influenced me that I saw growing up, like Jackie Chan movies and like I don't know like anime right those, those kinds of things that have like this kind of uh energy and humor um to olivia's point uh definitely yes um thank you again john for that question it was very fruitful like you got you got a whole dissertation from us <laughs> um yes uh thank you ed for for giving those recommendations of books and and to nick yeah please keep going with the suggestions we're happy to yeah any any and all suggestions we will we're very uh very interested open to the, the musical is very much still in process even though Skylar has written 26 songs even though it's 90 minutes it's still there's still depths to be mined so uh, and and audiences to reach so thank you I'll just make sure that we're we're uh I'm checking our YouTube audience here to see if they are tuning in, if they have any questions for us. Mm -hmm. PS124 in Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, we would love to work with, um, yeah, if they have a theater club, yes, especially. Um, yeah, ultimately one of our, one of our uh, goals is to sort of, uh, you know, get it, get something uh, on stage, you know, after after the whole year of the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry, you go, you go. Go, 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 go. Oh no, I just, I just saw that there's a question in there too. Yeah, many Asian immigrant children, uh, sorry, Asian immigrant parents, but the children to be doctors, lawyers. How did your parents feel about going to the arts? So yeah, I I think um, my I mean my parents are pretty supportive. Uh, I know part of it is also they're from they're from the U.S. Uh, and also just wanted to point out that I get well. I mean I guess I don't. I'm not officially in like only in the arts right now. I uh, work in environmental. Uh, in, like green building uh, as a day job. And I also uh, studied environmental science in college while while simultaneously doing the arts. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that it's, uh, 
it, it's important for for uh, for us to talk about talk about this and sort of like how um, people's expectations will influence what uh, the choices you make in life. Yeah, a big shout out to anyone in Skylar's family who's listening. Thank you so much for supporting us throughout our journey of the last few years. Um, you you've been you've been great supporters of our work. Thank you. You know, another, another funny sort of anecdote is that, um, you know, fellow Asian American parents sometimes ask my mom, like, uh, you know, they were trying to get their kids to study classical music and play piano um, as like a, yeah, just just in that sort of lens. And they ask my, they, they see that me and my brother uh, are like, just like when we got home from school, we would just automatically like just start playing piano. Um, and they asked my mom, like, how did you get them to play piano? And she said, oh, I just actually let them, you know, play the music they, they liked. Uh, <laughs> and that's part of it too. Uh, curious how many in the audience had relatives go through Angela. I'm like, oh, really? Your dad and grandfather also went through. Or Ellis Island, you know, we're, we're here for that too. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the musical takes place in 1923. Um, so that's, that's very close to when your grandfather would have gone through. What, um, Nick, do you know uh, what their story was when they were detained there? Uh, were they also, uh, were they young when they, they came or? Mm -hmm. And were they detained and interrogated for a long time as well? So oh, that's that's good, relatively short time. So we had another question. Tell us about the production you already had. Mm, yes, yes, yeah. definitely. You want to take this one, Olivia? Um, sure. So <laughs> the production that we had was about two years ago at, at Yale. And it was a workshop production because Skylar was literally writing the songs uh, up, to, up to three days before the show. So to Skylar's credit, he wrote 26 songs. It is a sung through musical that, that runs 90 minutes. And by sung through, I mean that it has very little, if any, spoken dialogue. All of the action and the dialogue happens through either rap or uh, singing so that's a huge endeavor and to do this over the course of about nine months is also insane so we had the first half of the show very solidly down and Skylar had written the songs months before our cast had time to prepare and to um, learn the songs by heart and we did staging and all of that then towards the end of the show there were some songs that Skylar knew he wanted to write and was writing, but um, didn't have time to fully flesh out. And we didn't have time to teach our um, cast completely and they didn't have time to memorize it. So instead what we opted to do was we embraced the workshop production element and we had our, our cast hold their scripts for just a couple songs. And, um, and we sort of, as Skylar was saying before, peeled back the curtain and showed them that this is a musical in process. And ideally that won't happen this time around. But what was great about that was it was our first audience. It was sort of test audience. And uh, we worked with cast members who had never done theater before. They were spoken word artists or acapella singers. And they were just really passionate about the show and about its mission and story. So that was a really cool experience for us to bring people who had never done theater before into our cast and uh, into the theater because they, they brought with them other people who wouldn't have seen a musical otherwise. Yeah, and uh, also just shout out to you, Olivia, because you you did a great job directing it. Was, it, was that also your first uh, musical that you? Um, I had done some dance theater piece, a Stravinsky mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. piece before, um, but it was my first contemporary musical. Um, mm -hmm. I, I directed straight plays before, so. Yeah, it was a great adventure for the two of us to just figure out how to put these musicals together. Um, yeah. And, and ultimately, like, even though, like, you know, behind the curtain, it, it felt like it was very, it was very, you know, last minute and uh, it, it, 
people I, the the i guess the feedback we got from the audience was like it really blew us away because the, you know some people from chinatown came up and came up to yale and saw it and they were they were just like i've never seen something like this before this gives me life and that i think that those kinds of um, that kind of feedback is another reason why we're definitely uh that definitely fuels us to want to keep working on it and uh, developing it and bringing it to the stage. Yeah, very, very uh, affecting. Um, oh, thank you to Jennifer. You probably have left already. And <laughs> to, to anyone who needs to run, you know, feel free. We've reached our hour limit. But if anyone else has questions or wants to stick around to share anything, please feel free. But it, if not, uh, thank you again for coming and enjoy your evening. We hope to see you at future future performances, presentations, etc. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Nick, again for introducing us and to the board. Did I ever fail a fit? Yes, yes. I definitely did. I'm <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> defy stereotypes. Ah, <laughs> um, uh, yes, we would love to see it there too. <laughs> yes, they Thanks. do really cool work. Would love to see it there. Would love to be there. <laughs> yeah. We are working on it. But if you have if you have any connections, we would love an introduction. <laughs> Thank you all again. Um, yeah, feel free to stick around if you have questions or comments um, or to email us. Thank you, Ed, for being here and for everything you do with the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. <laughs> yeah, so please, um, now you, you all have our emails um, through the RSVP, the, the link email that I sent. So, Please feel free to follow up with us via email if you have suggestions or you want to connect us to anyone, we'd be so grateful. And we'll be sending up a thank you email also after this with all the links. Um, was there anything on any questions on YouTube or? I didn't. Uh, oh. Well, an audience member said you should submit yourselves to the Fringe Festival if you haven't already. Really good job tonight. This is much needed and I am very excited to see what's next for all of you. Thank you, Sebastian, for that comment. Um, I don't know the status of the Fringe Festival these days. It, it shut down for a little while because I think its structure was untenable, uh, but I hope they're coming back because that would be great for us. <laughs> we would love to submit to them. Thank you again for the suggestion. All right, thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone. All right, so um, if no one has any other questions, I'm gonna end the presentation. But again, this is not the end of our connection. So please feel free to, to reach out to us and stay connected on social media and via email and all of that. So thank you again.